Welcome all to another lecture of the coming Renaissance theories, this time on Heidegger and the other beginning. As always, feel free to subscribe, to share the video, to support the channel any way you can, if you like, and leave a comment. The lecture this time is on Heidegger on the other beginning, the andere Anfang. And I'd also like to say that I will very soon make a pro give a lecture on the meaning of Renaissance. But let's just stick to the other beginning now. Perhaps the night of the world has fallen. Nietzsche, in his essay The Hiker and His Shadow, published in 1880, says that perhaps all of Europe will still stand when only 30 of its most important books and nothing but these books remain. That the spirit of Europe could live and breathe through these fundamental works and carry itself over into another realm of meaning. What Nietzsche saw more clearly than most in the 19th century is the acute danger of the utter death of deep memory, nemnosine, from which all meaning at all arises. Will only some stored books be enough? Or does it require those who carry on the torch? What horror is Nietzsche pointing us to here? Perhaps the deep freeze of history we have been experiencing, which is the making available of all data of the so-called past, the historicizing of all great thinkers and their thought, the disambiguation processes of the grand machine, the historicization of even what has not happened yet, was something that becomes historical before it even takes place, the weird eerie capacity to calculate with the space and time and to calculate historical events and to eradicate history in the way that we are now so accustomed to do. What, though, eludes this so-called history? Even those who continue to critique the notion of the end of history have got nothing more to say, it seems, that obviously there are still events happening, even world historical events, events of such a magnitude that so-called liberalism no longer is the final state and stage of history. Those critiques, however, are still trapped in a representational calculative account of history, which accounts, accounts literally, for all the various occurrences, and then compares and evaluates them as to the correspondence value with the mere schema of the so-called end of history. But why at all? The end has seemingly become so prevalent in late modern thought in a time that calls itself late modern. Why does it call itself late modern? Why does it give itself a name? And why does it think of itself as late? Why, again, I ask, has the end become so prevalent? This does not seem to occur to some as the genuine question to be pondered. Why is it that Hegel has to speak of art as something of the past, apparently? Why is it that Hegel, of all thinkers, Hegel, speaks of a certain silliness and boredom that are both arriving and making a scene as the signs of the new age, as he says in the prelude to the phenomenology of spirit. What is it that ends? And what does end truly mean? Never an incision, an apocalypse in thought, nowhere to be seen either with the advocates or the opponents of the end of history. All just blissfully calculate event against event and schematically compare 
all perceived occurrences from the pigeonholes and the trunkets of history, so-called. But the fault, and this is of course morally speaking, if you allow me, the fault lies not even with those reacting in such ways. Rather, it is the language that drives this. And the language, the lingua franca of the world, is English. For the English vernacular, just like French or Italian, knows no word for what the German vernacular calls Geschichte. In the 20th century, it was Martin Heidegger who suffered through this experience of the exhaustion of meaning most severely. And one has to be careful here not to begin to calculate historically either so that we compare the 19th century with the 20th century, etc. Not to orient oneself according to the need cultural pigeonholes and classifications and ideas and representations of what some century or ism or other has meant and means for us. That's not the level of Geschichte. We need to think not historically. We need to think decisively not in an English or French way, but in the way of the tidings and betidings of being which we mortals suffer. And to give a bit of an indication which are not linear and which are not circular either. That's representation, accounts of history. It's like Spengler's idea of the cycles of history are just a representation. In his Beiträge zur Philosophie, Heidegger writes the following. The sudden extinguishing of the great fire, this leaves behind something, not really something, it's a poor translation. This leaves behind that which is neither day nor night, which no one grasps and in which human beings have come to the end, still bustle about so as to benumb themselves with the products of their machinations, pretending such products are made for all eternity, perhaps for that, and so on and so forth, which is neither day nor night. The endless twilight persists, I now say, it's the end of quote, perhaps even in the seemingly most incisive and decisive occurrences, what is abandoned immediately is truth. The cave has become the world, and we are left a primordial war of electrified ideas, always under threat while ourselves wanting to execute. But we are always under threat of neuroplastic rearrangement, which at the same time we want to execute. What does then Geschichte truly mean? Why? is the end abundant. What is here pushing itself towards its end? Is the end just a superficially represented limit against which the millennia are pushing? Are we at this limit? Or are we this limit? What is it that Nietzsche means when he says, not only the reason of millennia, also her madness is breaking out within us, it is dangerous to be an heir. What does he mean by this? Would it not be myopic, representational, to take Hegel's, Nietzsche's and Heidegger's mentions of the end as simply something coming to its end in a visible and measurable sense? When Hegel speaks of art as something of the past, does this mean that art has simply passed? When Hegel speaks of Heidegger, when Heidegger speaks of the other beginning, der andere Anfang, in the German, in the Anfang, you hear fangen, which means to catch, to catch something. Does he mean then, does Heidegger mean with this, that simply that some series of events proudly lumped together under the head of metaphysics has merely come to pass, and now some other beginning is to take its course? 
Why is it that this epoch gives itself names? And why does it do so apparently in ever higher gear, labeling itself and throwing around calendar years of the past, which are to give us some sort of hold in the bleak twilight of this our age? This is like this year, this is like this year, and this year will come again, etc. You see, these are historical calculations. And again, the English vernacular, which is now the lingua franca, moving this world, does not know a word for Geschichte. It simply doesn't know a word for it. And hence, the genuine access to what Heidegger means by Seinsgeschichte, which is officially translated as history of being, is entirely impeded. It's impossible. There is no history of being. I should perhaps say this very clearly, there is no history of being. It's nonsense. It cannot be thought in this way. There's Seinsgeschichte. That perhaps can be thought of as the betidings or the tidings of being, which is something very different from some, some sort of history. And when Francis Fukuyama uses the history, the end of history, for his means, Hegel does nowhere speak of the end of history. Nowhere does Hegel speak of the das Ende der Historie. Complete nonsense. Now, Geschichte, he says in his Geschichtsphilosophie, he says, diese Geschichte ist nun zu ihrem Ende gekommen. This Geschichte of philosophy has now come to its end. So, let's see again that there is always something at stake in what we say, that not everything that we say means something in that being is rare. So why again is it that this epoch gives itself names? Why does it have to label itself? Where is this age? What is the bleak twilight of this our age? How has this epoch come about? How is it that something can seemingly come to an end? Whence this apparent fetishization of the end on all sides, of collapse, of extinction, the will to deconstruct, to destroy, or also to represent, to imagine some fanciful technicolor or post-apocalyptic future? What is this other than the incapacity to enter into the mode of genuine thinking, calculative representation, Vorstellung, ideas, has got us captured. And this has all to do with language. Philosophically, to think of the end as where something concretely ends would not be appropriate. That's representational. The limit of a thing is not where it ends, but where the thing begins philosophically. Of course, one has to be mindful, and this is not the place here to do this, what thing in the English vernacular really means. The end of history, of this series of events, which was proclaimed by Fukuyama and others, and Heidegger even speaks of das Ende der Philosophie, the end of philosophy. But then the end here would not be where some line of events finds a final stage or where we can debate or not debate about the end of history as mere events or the question for genuine access to the cavernous betiding and weirdness does not only remain unasked but is in fact by all sides vehemently fought, I'll say this again, there is no genuine access on all sides of this so-called discourse to the cavernous betiding and weirdness of being. This remains unasked, even by those who most prominently want to argue against the so-called end of history, because there are still events occurring in the world, oh really. Thoughts that come on Duff's feet guide the world, says Nietzsche's Zarathustra. Thoughts that come on Duff's feet guide the world. The battles of images and mere ideas are the herd's machinations and its aimless and so on and back and forth of isms pinned against ism. 
one may watch out for those who, with some indignation, stand for one ism over another, and those who apply isms to the so-called history of philosophy. Here never genuine thinking can or may even arise. There is no history of philosophy. There is only thinking. Hence it is that Heidegger says, in a short note somewhere, because the history of philosophy, just to make this very clear, mere contingency. To, you know, I'm a bit interested here, maybe some Plato, some Aristotle, and find it quite interesting what's being said over here. And I'm, I'm comparing then this with Spinoza, and it's quite interesting. But you know, analytical philosophy had a, a program which was to get rid of and the, it, even the history of philosophy, which has now ended, so then they've now come back to applying isms to various uh, uh, philosophers. That's contingency, and that's sophistry. It's thinking against thinking. It's logos turning against itself. There is necessity to thought. The first paragraph of being in time is die Notwendigkeit einer ausdrücklichen Wiederholung der Seinsfrage. The necessity of an explicit repetition of the question of being. Now, again, there is no history of philosophy. There is only thinking. Hence it is that Heidegger in a short note somewhere says that metaphysics is only now that it has come into its own, into its completion, into its full consciousness of itself. That's what consciousness means for Hegel. Now it's standing before Occidental man and is now in need of having to be thought again. It is dangerous to be an heir. The chit-chat about the end of history, of those against and those in favor of it, is the constant denial of this most terrible responsibility that we Heirs, shoulder. For thoughts that come on dust feed, guide the world. And I must point out very clearly that those who still claim that Heidegger uses metaphysics as a pejorative are either not very good readers, at best, or at worst, something more sinister. Heidegger does not use metaphysics as a pejorative. Absolutely not. There is nothing here without metaphysics. And Heidegger is not a contingent sophist um, who more simply wants to get away from uh, from philosophy and its and, and, and its his, and its and its burden. Um, and maybe I should point out also that attempts to move back behind a pre-Kantian ism, you know, like the speculative realism, etc. A, 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 a non-critical or anti-critical philosophy is um, is a trend, is a fashion, and will end as all trends and fashions end. Um, they will just disappear and then be rehashed in a couple of decades if there is still anything to 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 rehash something. So now again, thoughts that come on Duff's feet guide the world. Why else do you reckon? There's a mad drive everywhere to attempt and control the brain and its neuronal labyrinths as these opposed rarefied locus of thought, if not for the very fear that there is something else that betides, that befalls, that sways in thinking and the thoughts that have been thought. The neurosciences are the sorry containment measures against the silence of guiding thoughts that hold sway through the eons and are the sparks of the spirit that thinkers respond to, all at once and all out of the same one origin. Those thoughts cannot be contained. Hence also the drive to try to eradicate language. That's the one thing, together with death, death and language stand in the way of utter technological control. Why do you think must the machine demand secondary and tertiary and tertiary sources in the academic sphere? A million sources, but never access to the one genuine origin. 
uk emu, ala tulugu, akusantes homologein, sophonis tin hen panta enai, says Heraclitus. Not to me, but to the logos, it is wise to listen to. And it is wise to listen to and to correspond to it, homologein, out of the one. Estin hen panta enai, that one is many, that one is many. Das eine, die eine. We are still at the crossroads where we either become great destroyers, subtly attempting to tame thinking into its mere functionality, or where another beginning becomes necessarily possible. Necessarily possible. The other beginning of which Heidegger speaks does not demand to tear down the old, for the old is just the oldest name of being itself. Be aware of those, as I said before, who still claim that Heidegger wants a radical zesura, a fundamental break away from the metaphysics and the old. He declaredly does not deconstruct. He declaredly does not destroy the Logos. Completely the opposite is the case. Heidegger from the beginning reminds us of the necessity of the question of being. The sophists are those who proclaim concealed or not concealed. They proclaim contingency. And you, contingency comes in many forms. Wanting to overcome an age, the will to end something, those are modes as well of contingency, for it is not upon the mortal being to make another age. Instead, it is upon the mortal being to take over what has been and deliver it over in a thinking manner into the genuine coming to towards us. It is upon us today to see what is at stake here. The question what it means to be human, what it means to be, whether there can at all be something still that properly is our very freedom in this sense. All this is at stake. As the philosopher Nina Power recently and provocatively asked to shake us and awaken something within us in the middle of the word, quote from Nina, didn't you want the collapse of all meaning, the end of history, the death of memory, the untethering of all signifiers? Are we going to continue to walk gloriously and blindly towards the monstrous constellation of machine, or are we beginning to walk towards a human world? A world without meaning, a world that is manufactured for the sake of power empowering itself to more power, a world, hence, that does not know the old, a world, hence, that is not a world at all, a world without being, where nothing ever is, or towards a world where there is being, where meaning sways. Again, Heidegger nowhere wants to end metaphysics. Heidegger never uses metaphysics as a pejorative. His project, like Hegel's, is the dissolvement of ontology. Yes, yes, insofar as traditional ontology takes being as something present at hand and posited and forgets negativity, withdrawal, non-availability, concealment, and ultimately also death. But this does not mean to tear down tradition. Rather, Heidegger says, Überlieferung, that Tradition in German means Überlieferung, that which delivers itself over. Rather, Heidegger says that the other beginning is only possible out of and with the first. That means out of the one unifying origin. Hen panta einai. Is the taking over and taking responsibility for that which has been thought and finding again hold and the stands in the midst of being. The constant talk about the end together with the constant talk of abundant crisis, as Daniel Saruba has pointed out. Perhaps, as Daniel says, this, what this talk about the crisis indicates is that the will to control, the will to will, that means that the subject and its subjectivity have reached the utmost maximum and have to realize that not everything can be controlled. At one, however, the end also indicates something else. There is at least a duplicity prevailing in this phenomenon, namely the unclosing or breaking into 
of a realm hitherto withdrawn, such that the incisions of thinking, the silent thoughts, are beginning to show their truth and weight, while also these thoughts are right there with us, coming towards us, and coming towards us especially thanks to Kant's revolution of thought, which has brought thought into its own critique with itself, such that this plane of tiding shut open for us to suffer through. I will now read from Heidegger's Beiträge, a lengthy passage on the other beginning, which perhaps gives some insight, some hints at what has opened up with Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and what has become necessary to be thought in this moment. Where Heraclitus perhaps stands right behind us again. And I quote from Heidegger. The disentanglement of philosophy from the snares binding it to the grounding of science, to the interpretation of culture, to serving world views, and to metaphysics as its proper essence, is merely the consequence of the other beginning. And only as such a consequence can it truly be found. The other beginning is the more original appropriation of the concealed essence of philosophy, of the concealed realm of philosophy, a realm which itself arises out of the realm of being and which, according to the specific purity of the origin, remains closer to the essence of decision pertaining to the thinking of being. The disentanglement then has its consequence, has as its consequence a necessary change in the usual way of representing what philosophy is precisely within the sphere of the always persistent everyday opinion, namely no longer an edifice of thinking, but the apparently random bestrol of blocks queried from the bedrock, with the chisels and crow bars remaining invisibles. Invisible are the blocks secluded configurations, or disjoint pieces for holding up an invisible bridge. Who could know that? Philosophy in the other beginning Questions by way of asking for the truth of being, seen from the horizon of the now explicit cut between beings and being, and calculated on the basis of a historiological comparison to metaphysics and its starting point in beings, the questioning in the other beginning might look like a simple inversion, that means a crude one. It is precisely the thinking of the tidings of being, which knows from the realm of mere inversion, that in such a procedure the most inflexible and insidious enslavement is at work, and that the inversion does not overcome anything. It merely brings the inverted into power all the more, and provides the inverted with a previously lacking entrenchment and completeness. The questioning of being out of the Geschichtlichkeit, the tidings, the betidings of being is not an inversion of metaphysics. It is instead a decision, Entscheidung, cut, as the projection of the ground of that difference to which even the inversion must adhere. Such projection brings this questioning altogether outside of that difference between beings and being. This questioning, therefore, now even writes being as being, which is supposed to, in being as being with a Y, which is supposed to indicate that being is here now twisting free from the overcome um, ontological ways of thinking of being and now enters into the way of thinking in a way that's seinsgeschichtlich, that thinks the tidings of being and in such a way um, that the other beginning stems from out of the first beginning and lives only, lives and breathes by walking through the first beginning and, the, and philosophy again in such a way that another path or new paths open up from within what's hiding itself, from within what's absconding and disabsconding in these texts, which are 
ours and which are our memory. So thank you very much indeed. As always, keep well and see you soon.